the midst of all this battle, God, in the midst of all the chaos, in the midst of the division within the nation, Lord, Father, Lord, we acknowledge, God, that, Lord, you remain sovereign in spite of all of this. God, we acknowledge, God, that you are the name above all names, God. You are the name, Father, that deserves our praise. Father, right now, Lord, here in this place, God, we give you the glory that you deserve. We worship you, Lord. We worship you, God, because, Lord, you deserve it all, Father. You deserve all praise, Father. You are the name above all names, and you are worthy of all our praise, God, Lord. We worship you, Father. We worship you. Worship the Lord right here in this place today.
angels all around. My delight is found in knowing that you wear the victor's crown. You're my help and my defender. You're my savior and my friend. By your grace I live and breathe to worship you. Come on, church. At the mention of your greatness, in your name I will bow down. In your presence, fear is silent, for you wear the victor's crown. Let your glory fill this temple. Come on, you just let your power overflow. By your grace, I live and breathe to worship you. right here in our midst we thank you Lord for this freedom that you have poured out right here in this place we thank you God and we praise you for you are indeed good for you are indeed faithful for you are indeed true to your word we thank you God for your spirit is arising in our hearts that we can hope in you Lord because your spirit is in us, there is peace. Let God, let this worship resound to your throne. Let this worship resound to your throne room today. Wherever we are, whether we are watching in our homes right now, let this worship resound to you, God. Holy Spirit, move in every heart right now. Even those who are watching right now, move in every heart, Lord. not only be our savior but you are our lord you are our master therefore we surrender our hearts before you we surrender our hearts before you god we honor you we glorify your name we exalt you jesus and we give you the highest praise in christ's name we pray amen and amen oh, let's just let's just give the lord the praise that he deserves today
Welcome to Trinity Christian Fellowship. We're excited that you have chosen to worship with us today. This year, let's also be excited as we journey and be strengthened in the faith together. In line with the announcement made by our government and our desire to protect the congregation and the general public, our worship services will continue to be made available through live streaming, maximizing the use of technology. Therefore, we encourage worshiping the Lord together in our homes or in small groups. Reach us online through our Facebook page, Trinity Christian Fellowship. Moreover, all other large ministry gatherings during weekdays are likewise suspended. We encourage life groups to continue meeting via online platforms. Starting Monday, March 23, we are inviting everyone to join us as we journey once more using our Church in Action booklet. We believe God is on the move. A call to a 21-day fast starting tonight at 6 p.m. until April 12. We will seek the Lord together as a church and stand in the gap for our nation. And that is all for our announcements. At this point, let's ready our hearts for the Word. You may take out your Bible, your journal, and your pen as we write down what God has in store for us today to be shared by the servant of the Lord, our senior pastor, Dave King. Well, good morning, church. And um, we know that we're living in a very perilous or troublesome time. But this is a wonderful day that we can still continue to worship the Lord. We know that we are living now in precaution because of what's happening not only all over the world or in our nation, but also in our city. And we want to remember that precautionary measure is different from living in fear. We are meant to live by faith, but we are also meant to live with wisdom. And therefore, as we do precautions, we want to keep each one of us safe so that we can continue to serve the Lord longer in the future. And so today we're going to talk about how we can move in the right spirit. In the Bible, Jesus was talking about the different signs that will come before his second coming. And he mentioned so many things, and it's amazing how these things are happening right before our eyes. But the Lord is good because he prepared us before the end of last year. We talk about the last days. We talk about unveil the book of Revelation. And we are reminded that everything is about Jesus Christ. We are not to focus on the events that are happening and live in fear, but rather we are to focus our eyes on Jesus and be confident in the victory that he has won for us on the cross. And that's why as these things are happening before the end of the year and continue to happen at the beginning of this year, we know that many people are wondering, is this the last days? Are we living in the end times? And is Jesus Christ coming back soon? Now we know that Jesus said that he is coming and we are living in the last days. However, we also remember what Jesus said. When you see all these signs, remember the end is still to come. Because there is a sign in the Bible that Jesus gave us. In fact, Jesus said in Matthew 24, 32 to 35, Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twig get tender and its leaf come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see all these things, you know that it is near right at the door. Truly, this is what Jesus said, I tell you that this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things happen. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. And yet at the same time, Jesus also mentioned that when these things happen, we need to remember there is one sign that will remind us that Jesus' coming is imminent. That is when the gospel has been preached to the ends of the whole world. Then the end will come. And so I believe that in, in, I believe in the midst of all this that are happening, and even with this pandemic called the NCOV virus that is going around the world, God is awakening His church to fulfill the Great Commission. And so this virus, this pandemic, I believe, is a passing thing because God is cleansing the church and purifying the church so that the church will rise up and do its part in winning the people for God. 
God is moving us to fulfill the Great Commission because only when the Great Commission has been fulfilled will the coming of Jesus happen. And so the Bible reminds us we have to be aware of the signs but not focus on the things that are happening and be afraid. Instead, we live by faith and understand that God is moving His church to something bigger and something great. And so I believe that when this, when this crisis is over, the church will rise up, the church will awaken, and the church will do its part in fulfilling the Great Commission. And that's why we need to be excited instead of being afraid. We need to be excited because we're living in such a time that so many things are happening, and the move of God is going to increase greater and greater before the coming of Jesus Christ. That's why we need to remember Never live in fear, but instead live by faith because we are living in an exciting time. Don't think of it as terrifying and terrible times. Yes, it is terrible times, but the Bible says perilous and terrible times to unbelievers. But for believers, it should be an exciting time. So if you are a true believer and you are living in fear, then you have to ask yourself, whether your relationship with God is strong or whether your relationship with God is real. But if you're living by faith, then you know that behind all this, God is preparing the church for something great and something wonderful. That's why Jesus said, look at the sign and be excited. In fact, Jesus said that this generation will not pass away until all these things happen. Could it be that this is that generation that will welcome the coming of Jesus Christ. So I don't know about you, if you look at the saints of the past, how they have lived for God, many of them were living in excitement and anticipation that their Messiah and Savior is coming back. If we don't have that excitement that we will welcome our Savior while we are alive, then I don't know what our relationship with God is. One speaker said, that prior to, our, to this generation, we start naming them by letters. So we call the previous generation, Generation X, followed by Generation Y, and followed by Generation Z. And so he said, there's no letter that comes after Z. So could it be that this is the last generation, and we are in that generation that will welcome the coming of Jesus Christ? And so, therefore, we need to understand the nature of fear. Fear is very powerful. It can cripple a person. It can immobilize a, a person. So when Christians are living in fear, they live immobilized and crippled. In other words, they don't do anything for the kingdom of God because they are afraid. Fear is reactive. In other words, when we are afraid, we respond and react to that fear. And most of the time, our response is to run away or is to hide ourselves because we're afraid. And fear results to panic. While the Spirit of God, the Bible says, brings power and sound mind because God did not give us the spirit of fear. Therefore, the Spirit of God brings power and sound mind, and that is proactive. The power of God and a sound mind cause us to move and do things for the kingdom of God. Now, we need to understand the background of the word panic. Like pandemonium, pandemic, if you notice, all of this start with the word pan. Pan is a Greek god. He is a half man, half goat, who was often depicted as playing music on pipes. And that's why these flutes were known as Pan flutes. And interestingly, he is believed to have a dark side as well. And the story goes, Pan liked to nap in a cave or in the forest. And if somebody disturbed his sleep, he would let out a terrifying scream. In fact, whenever the, the Greek gods go to war, Pan would would call out a scream that is so loud that the enemy will become afraid. And so the Greek who heard the frightening sound in secluded places blamed Pan's fury and spoke of being struck by panikondaima or panic fear. And if we look at the Bible, Jesus one time told Peter, and I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Jesus was speaking confidence to Peter and to his church that the church can stand the test and the trials that the, the enemy will throw at him. In fact, 
Jesus was saying that the gates of hell itself will not stand because the church will be victorious. But the background of this, of this story is about Jesus going with his disciples to the region of Caesarea Philippi. And that's where Jesus asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they replied, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, Jesus asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. For this was not revealed to you by men, but by my Father in heaven. It's very interesting. For Jesus, just to ask his disciples, who do you say I am? He has to bring them so far away to the area of Caesarea Philippi. Why would Jesus bring them all the way up to north? Just to ask them a question. Because in that place, he wants to show them something. In Caesarea Philippi, in Caesarea Philippi are temples dedicated to worship to the worship of false gods. And in fact, the popular god in Caesarea Philippi is a god called Pan, the half man and half goat. And the temple of Pan is built outside a cave with a river that is going inside a cave. And so if you go to Caesarea Philippi today, you will see the, the ruins and the remains of that cave and you can still see the river flowing inside. So in Greek mythology, they believe that, there, that when there's a river going inside a cave, it is, it is a river that leads people to hell. And that's why that cave or that temple is called the gates of hell. So Jesus, actually, when he was telling Peter, I tell you, you are Peter, and upon this rock, Jesus was not definitely referring to Peter, as that rock, nor was Jesus referring to himself as traditionally believed to be the rock. Although we believe that Jesus is the firm foundation, but Jesus was pointing to the mountain behind him saying, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not overcome. Jesus is giving us a picture of the church that is fearless, a church that is full of God's army, that is ready to charge through the gates of hell for the purpose of bringing people outside hell, for the purpose of helping people receive freedom from the bondage of the enemy. And so it is our task as a church to live fearlessly, and especially in times like this, we continue to encourage people, we continue to reach out to people. We may not do so physically because of so-called social distancing, but we can do it through social media. We can continue to to send messages and, and encourage people who are fearful. I believe that God will give us wisdom how we can be a church in times like this. But the Bible also reminds us that there are things that we need to do. Not only should we not react in fear, but we should respond by seeking God and obeying God's will more than any time. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. It's very interesting that even in the midst of all this that are happening, people are bashing one another, and definitely people are speaking against the government. You know, it's time like this that people have to unite in prayer have to unite in seeking the Lord. And yet, the division among people are still so strong. Sad to say, that division is not only among ordinary people, but that division is even very visible among the body of Christ. There are those who, who speak against the government. There are those who, who defend the government. It's not about defending and speaking against the government right now that matters. It's about praying for the government that God will give them wisdom. You know, sometimes we are tempted to ask people who keep on asking and questioning every move of the government that if they were in that position, would they know what to do? But you see, as Christians, we are called to seek God and seek His will and obey Him. And so the Bible tells us that Jesus 
is our ultimate example. We have to follow him. As followers of Jesus Christ, we are not only following his actions. You know, some people when they follow somebody, when they model some when they model after somebody, or when when they become disciple of somebody, they follow the physical features or the physical action of that person. But the Bible is reminding us, as followers of Jesus Christ, we are not to follow the features and the, uh, the, the external things of Christ, but we are to follow the heart of Jesus Christ. And the Bible tells us that Jesus exemplified love. And, and more than any time in the world, love is what is needed right now. It's time for people not to live selfishly because Jesus not only exemplified love, he lived a selfless life. In fact, he gave his life to others so that they may know God and be saved. It is in this moment wherein the church have to rise up and selflessly help and minister those who need the help. Jesus' life itself was an offering unto God. You know, our offering is not about giving this and giving that to God, but our offering is our very life. Because the Bible tells us in the book of Romans, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. That is your spiritual act of worship. Our life should be an offering unto the Lord, and everything that we do should be a pleasing sacrifice unto God. But the Bible also said, not only should we follow the example of Christ, but as Christians, we should not live in sin. Because Paul said in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 3 to 7, But among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity, of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Now take note, Paul is saying they are improper for God's holy people. Paul was not talking about unbelievers. Paul was talking about believers who are not living their lives in purity. That's why Paul said we need to live holy lives. And Paul continued to say, Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. A person may call himself Christians, you may call yourself a Christian, but if your life do not demonstrate holiness, if you're living in sin, Paul said, I'm sorry, you have no place, no inheritance in the kingdom of God. You see, the Bible reminds us that Christianity is not a label. Christianity is not just a title. Christianity is a relationship with God. So even if you put a label in front of you, Christian, or you put a, 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 a necklace with a cross, it doesn't matter. It will not get you to heaven. Because only a life that is lived by faith in what Jesus did for you, because only a life that is lived by faith through Christ, and in obedience to the will of God will bring a person to the kingdom of heaven. I'm not saying that we need good works to be saved. Yes, the Bible says, for it is by the grace of God and through faith that we are saved. But the Bible also reminds us that faith without work is dead. In other words, your works, your holy life is the demonstration of the faith that you have in Jesus Christ. If there is no manifestation of a changed life, if there's no manifestation of holiness in you, then, on the first place, there is no faith in you. The Bible is reminding us that Christianity is not about going to church, feeling good, and enjoying the blessing of the Lord. But Christianity is about that relationship that you have with God through Jesus Christ that caused you to live a holy life. That's why the Bible says, you are now a new creation in Christ. The old has gone and the new has come. So therefore, not only do we live holy lives, but the Bible reminds us, we need to have holy lips. In whatever we say, it matters. Especially in this season of trial, we need to speak life. We need to speak positive things. We need to speak faith. Because many people are, are living and speaking negatively. You know, as a Christian, you should be the last person 
who would respond in negativity because you have experienced the grace of God in your life. If your mouth is full of negativity, then it shows the condition of your heart. But if you are able to speak life, if you are able to speak hope, if you are able to speak faith, that it, then it also demonstrates what is in your heart. For out of the abundance of the heart, the Bible says, the mouth, what comes out of your mouth? Is it positive things, faith-building things, hope-giving things, or is it negativity that pulls people down, that causes others to be discouraged and to lose faith in God? And third, the Bible says we need to have holy minds. You see, what we think will affect us. How we think and process things will affect us. Therefore, when we experience negative thoughts, we need to bring it before the Lord and allow God to speak to us. That's why in this season where it is impossible for us to gather together as a church because of, because of the crisis that is happening, all the more we need to learn how to go to the Lord daily. You know, we thank the Lord that even in the midst of this crisis and, and, and quarantine, we have the time more than any time in our life. We have time to spend. Unfortunately, people are idle. All of a sudden, they don't know what to do because they have been used to being busy, doing this and doing that. But now in the midst of idleness, could it be that the Lord is reminding us to redeem our time and use our time wisely? That's why we encourage the church. Take this time to read your Bible. Take this time to, to soak yourself and be rooted in God's Word. Take this time to read Christian books that would encourage you and inspire you. But more than anything, spend this time with the Lord so that your faith may be built up in this season. And the Bible says in verses 8 to 17 of Ephesians 5, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient are doing in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. I believe that God is using this crisis to bring out darkness and bring out light. You see, sometimes it's difficult for the world to see who are the real believers and who are not. But crisis causes the real believers, the real Christians to rise up. And therefore, the world will be able to see who are the real disciples of Jesus Christ. And that's why what followed after is what, what Paul said. This is why it is said, Wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. It's time for the church to arise so that the light of Christ will shine through us and the world will see who Jesus is. And then the Bible says, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. And therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. So three things to wrap up. First, God is purifying His church. God is using this crisis to filter real believers from false believers. They're, they're people who are in church for various reasons. Some of them are there because they have just been following their parents or their grandparents to church. So they are Christian by generation, but not by heart. They are those who are in church because they need something from God. They have selfish reason and motive. And there are those who are in church because of friends and contacts. But then, this season of crisis will cause the church to be purified. Those who belong to God will stand firm and will rise up. There is a call that God is making, a call for His armies to wake up because we are in the last days. It's time for God's people to rise up and remember that we are in a battle. We are in a battle for souls. We are in a battle against the evil one who is trying to bring destruction upon the world, who is trying to cause moral decay to happen in this world. 
All the more as Christians, we need to let the light of Christ shine through us. But third, God is calling His people to action. That's why the Bible says we need to be careful. We need to live wisely. We need to make the most of every opportunity all the more because the days are evil. So therefore, the Bible says, do not be foolish, but understand what God's will is. So what do we do in times like this? The Bible reminds us in verses 18 to 20 of Ephesians 5, do not get drunk on wine which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're not going to talk about getting drunk, but instead, the Bible challenges us to be filled always with the Spirit of God. During this time where a lot of lies, a lot of um, fake news are going out, a lot of negativity are circulating in social media, we need the discernment of the Spirit to know what God is doing, how God is moving. Therefore, we need to always be filled with the Spirit of God. But second, we need to speak truth and life to one another. You know, people are confused. They don't know what the truth is. There are so many information out there that we don't know which one is true or not. We heard the news that um, one banana a day keeps the corona away. But later on, we found out that it is not true. And so there's a joke that um, after people bought all the banana in panic buying, they start buying the papaya. Why? Because they need a papaya to counteract the constipation that was brought about by the banana. But in times like this, where people are confused what is true and not, all the more as Christians, we need to show them what the truth is. We need to give them hope. We need to speak life and truth to them so that they may know that God is in control, that they may know God has a plan for everything. And so this brings us to the third thing. God is calling His people to action. As Christians, we need to rise up. We need to seek the Lord so that we may fulfill God's purpose and plans for this season. And God's plan includes you and me. God wants you and me to be part of whatever He is doing. And we have to be excited because we are part of God's great plan. When this crisis is over, there will be a great harvest wherein God is going to use each one of us to take care and disciple other people. We have to rise up and be ready when that time comes. That's why we need to respond by faith and not by fear. We need to live wisely with care but not be crippled by fear. We need to live precautionary lives but not immobilized. And therefore, only when we have the discernment of God's Spirit and the knowledge of God's will for this moment and season can we rise up and do the work that God has called us to be. And so get ready and be excited because a season of great things is coming. God is going to purify the church. God is going to cleanse the church so that the church will rise up in power. God's army will rise up in victory. And so we continue to encourage one another. We don't know what will happen next week. We don't know what will happen in days to come. We don't know if things will get better or things will worsen. But one thing we know, God will do wonders in seasons like this. And God is preparing us for the harvest that is to come. Let's pray. Lord, we come before your presence, O oh God. We thank you because your word is truth. We thank you, O oh God, because even in the midst of these things that we are seeing before our eyes, we know that by faith, you are in charge. You are in control. And the blood of Jesus Christ still prevails over every diseases and sickness. And so today, Lord, we come before your presence, O oh God, and we pray for your grace and healing upon those who are sick, even upon those who may have contracted the virus. And we pray, O oh God, that you keep the virus away from your people so that they will be under your care and protection. And Lord, I pray that more than anything else, that your people will rise up to be who you have called them to be, an army that serves your purpose and glorifies your name. And if there's any one of you who are not sure with your relationship with God, you're full of fear. You know, the Bible is saying, Jesus is saying, come to me and cast all your burden upon me. And if you want to do that, I would like to lead you in prayer as well. 
you can follow after me. Lord Jesus, in the midst of situations like this, I come before you because I acknowledge that I am hopeless and I am a sinner. But I thank you because you love me and you came to this world 2,000 years ago to die on the cross for my sin. Therefore today, Lord, I open my heart and I confess with my mouth that you are my Lord. I welcome you into my life. Be the Lord of my life. Take control and take charge of my life. And Lord, I thank you because through faith in you and by receiving you into my life, I am now a child of God. I have that personal relationship with you. And I thank you that I will be able to hear your voice and know what is in your heart so that I may fulfill your will and your purpose for my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we don't know how long this crisis will end. Things may get better or things will go worse. But regardless, we know that we are secured in the hands of God. Well, regardless whether we live or die, we know we are safe and secured in eternity in the hands of God. That's why Paul is able to say, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. While we are here in this world, we do everything to serve the Lord. And when our life in this world is over, we enjoy eternity with Him. And so let's continue to seek the Lord and pray as we begin our 21-day fast as well. And also keep posted for future announcement so that um, you will be updated if ever our worship service resume or we will continue worshiping the Lord through our live stream. So therefore, continue to live by faith and not in fear.